Okay, let's call the meeting to order. Roll call. Let the record show that all commissioners are present. Approval of minutes. The executive session and the regular meeting. I have a correction on the uh, regular meeting minutes. Okay. Um, Angie Nelson Deitch was here at the last meeting, so uh, just to put that as a correction. Uh, City Council liaison. Any other corrections? No. I'd move we would uh, approve the minutes from the last meeting with uh, Mr. Hendricks' addition. Second. There's a motion and a second. We approve the minutes as amended. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. Claims? Uh, our claims for February uh, 2020, uh, we have claims to Alan Cernak, uh for monthly retainer for 2020. The Great American Financial copier fee for uh, February 2020, NARO, which is a membership um, uh, for renewal to 2120 to 53121, being Longest Neff, BLN, for 11th Street Station Block Acquisition, uh, the Blue Chip to reimburse utility bills for 1215 East 2nd Street, um, Department of Water Works Utilities at 1215 East 2nd Street. Uh, Haas & Associates for the Feline House Expansion at Zoo. Uh, Johnny Doyle & Associates for Project Administration and Inspection, number 14. Uh, Neighborhood Capital Institute for Contract Extension Transitions Services. NIPSCO for Utilities at 1215 East 2nd Street. Plouffe, Shadley, Raker & Brown uh, for Legal Services at 1002 Franklin Street. SCB, uh, which is a TOD, uh, Transit Oriented Development uh, Advisory Service. Uh, Alan Saranac for legal fees for uh, North Tith, February of 2020. Uh, Walker Parking for a parking study addendum, final play, pay, sorry, not play, pay. Uh, and then for the South Tith Fund, we have Applied Ecological Services for Professional Services on Bon Tobel Wetland, Wash and Kelly. Ameriplex Drive Roadway Reconstruction Final Pay App, um, and then Alan Sandy for legal fees of South TIF for February of 2020. All right, any questions of Skyler on the claims? Skyler, this reimbursement for blue chip? Yes. Were they paying the utility bills? Yes, they were. They, uh, the, for some reason, when the um, once we purchased the property, the utilities were not transferred at that time, so there was probably about Alan, correct. When, when did we transfer that property? December? November? I think November. And so we did not, the, 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 trans, the transition of utility bills did not happen at the same time. I made sure those are done. They are corrected right now. So, but we still owe blue chip. They were the renter of the building at the time. And then the utility bills were still in their name. So I made sure that we corrected all that. And this is just the pay app for what they're, Reimbursed for. Okay. Is so in the Neighborhood Capital Institute? That was um, basically to uh, Ruth Wormer to help us with the transition between, um, I believe it was related to Station Block and Pine Street. Pine Street. And that was just the transitional period between, I guess, the new administration, new. Yeah. Unless we extend it, correct? Okay. All right. Balance sheet. No, oh, I guess we'll need a motion to approve the claims first. Second. Motion and second. We approve the claims as presented. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Balance sheet. 
uh, this is the MC Department of Redevelopment balance sheet for uh, one uh, at finalized in 131 2020. Uh, the cash uh, operating account is $159,481. Um, Southside TIF account is $5,609,981.74. Uh, the Southside TIF debt reserve account is $336,000. 336,257 dollars and 32 cents. Uh, Southside TIF capital account is 17,519 dollars and 46 cents. The North End TIF account is 4,399,383 dollars and 10 cents. Wabash Streetscape construction is 122,253 dollars and 14 cents. Wabash Streetscape Debt, sir, debt reserve is two hundred sixteen thousand and eight dollars and twenty eight cents. Northeast TIF account is one hundred thirty seven thousand nine hundred ninety one dollars and twenty five cents. Uh, loans receivable uh, loan to the east side TIF from operating account is twenty one thousand twenty dollars and forty nine cents. The county business loan fund is one hundred thirty three thousand three hundred thirty three dollars. Uh, for total assets of eleven million one hundred fifty three thousand two hundred thirty six dollars and seventy eight cents. Any questions of Skyler on the uh, financials? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. There's a motion and a second that we approve the financials as presented. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, the U.S. Bridge Project. Chris and Scott. Um, last time we had talked about some insignias on the bridge. Uh, I did get uh, some samples. Um, I'm sorry I didn't have them in your packet. I just didn't get them in there in time. Um, it looks like they did get a bid from Signcraft. The question was, how much do those um, bolt-on insignias cost? Uh, Chris is here. He can he can kind of you know, go into detail, more detail if, if we wish. But it looks like the average price of these range between uh, uh, eleven hundred and uh, eleven hundred dollars or a thousand and a thousand dollars to probably. I'd say sixteen hundred dollars, give give or take a few dollars. But it looks like we're not talking about a large amount of money. But it just depends on how many we want on the bridge. So I guess that would be the decision to be made. Um, I'll circulate some of these around, um, and then Chris can kind of expand upon. Um, you know, I think the other piece is that we don't have to make a decision immediately. They could be put on post. Uh, after we get the railing up, things of that nature. Uh, but I'll let Chris take it from here and expand on that. Thank you, Skyler. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. I'm Chris Murphy with Structure Point. Uh, Skyler covered the, the details pretty well on, on the uh, pricing that we've secured so far. We, we do have some requests into some other uh, sign manufacturers, uh, see if that uh, if pricing is consistent with the pricing that we have. Uh, I do want to note that uh, the, the price uh, of uh, $1,100 to $1,600 per um, emblem or, or per uh, symbol is uh, basically a, a quarter inch thick um, aluminum plate with a vinyl image on top of it um, that would uh, provide uh, uh, an emblem uh, on one side of the railing only. So if, if you wanted the emblem on both sides, on the inside and the outside of the railing, it'd be two times that price uh, and includes uh, the, uh, the hardware to amount uh, um, non-vandal uh, uh, proof hardware to mount those elements to the railing. Uh, the uh, the uh, size of the emblem is, is generally, they priced it at about two foot in diameter, 21 inches uh, in diameter, depending on which image um, uh, type that you're interested in. And uh, 
uh, I, I think uh, uh, at this point in time, uh, the, the opportunity to review what we think would be appropriate on the bridge and, and uh, we can pursue um, the actual uh, uh, details further on this. Uh, in the interim, as I collect additional information from other um, fabricators, I'll forward that information to Skyler for the Commission's consideration. Chris, could the emblem, uh, the question has been asked, I mean, could the emblem, the vinyl, be changed out and manipulated over time if we, obviously if it, fit, if it fades or say we want to go with a new scheme or a new, uh, highlight another piece of our city, the sure. zoo, the tower, the beach, the whatever that may be uh, over time, could we change those, can they be interchangeable, I guess is the question that was asked of me. I believe they can. I did not ask that question specifically, but I, I think they could. Um, they, they, um, the aluminum itself could be easily removed from the bridge um, uh, with the, the equipment to um, uh, utilize the vandal-proof bolt, and then it, it probably requires it removed, taken to the shop, um, professionally removed and professionally installed uh, for, with a replacement vinyl. Chris, how, how would this compare if we just put banners on the light post? Did you get a chance to look at that at all? Uh, I, I, I think it would, the banners would probably run less. Um, they're not as, the banners aren't necessarily as durable as these elements will be. Um, but uh, I, I, I think, uh, I think you could actually have both if you, if you wanted to, um, with the, the emblems being a more permanent item, you know, I always see, picture the banners as being seasonal, maybe. Uh, you know, uh, Fourth of July banners, Christmas banners, celebration, uh, because they just don't have that durability, typically, to be up there consistently year-round. Chris, what would be the, would you have a recommendation of what it would, would we do Two on each side on the entrances, two or two and one in the middle, a set in the middle, set on the end, set on the end, east, west, middle. Is there, a, do we have a, I don't recall us having a recommendation for how many of these in, insignias, if you will. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's primarily up to you. Um, in the past, we had talked about having um, uh, emblems in the four corners of the bridge, the, the last panel or the second last panel of the railing on each side of the bridge would have an emblem both on the inside and the outside of the railing. So it could be viewed by users on the uh, sidewalks on the bridge as well as um, uh, uh, Trail Creek uh, boaters and, and users of any uh, uh, improvements that are down there below the bridge. Uh, but that was just a, a, a point of discussion. Uh, I think uh, um, I think if you did have an interest in having uh, more emblems across the bridge uh, versus fewer, I would probably vary the, you know, consider varying the emblem uh, in different um, designs, you know, in different panels along the bridge. So it, it, it's not just a one single consistent emblem across the entire bridge. I guess that, that, that It'd be a, a direction I would consider if you wanted to do that uh, with more than just the corners of the bridge. That probably wasn't very helpful, but... Uh. <laughs> Any other questions of Chris? So what's our time frame? Uh, I, that's a good question. I, I'm, I'm, I think on the quote they probably gave us uh, a time frame for the estimate um, when they could be fabricated. I would imagine that they could be fabricated and be ready before the bridge railing is actually in place okay. on the bridge at this point in time. Correct. They're, they're just bolt on. That's correct. Does <clears throat> would the railing have to be fabricated for the? No, the, these will these will bolt on to the finished railing. Okay. And uh, so there is no specific fabrication of the railing that we have to worry about. Yeah, we we did not do a. Uh, a uh, custom railing on this. We chose an in dot specified railing, uh, so it's just a standard 
railing. It is something you'll be able to see through, but we did not uh, do a custom railing on this. That's correct. All right. okay, any other questions? Yeah, I, I guess I'd just like to make a comment. I think there's some really interesting um, pieces that we could put on these emblems. We have lots of good schools in, in the city. We have lots, lot, uh, a number of historic um, businesses that have been in and are still in Michigan City that we could maybe look to them to maybe do some of the funding and fundraising for these. So I think they're, even after the bridge is up and, and functional, we can still order them and put those in place. So interesting uh, piece for the bridge. Good idea. Okay, uh, well, why don't we shoot for making a decision at our next meeting? As far as how many and, uh, yeah, what we want to highlight, I don't know if. I believe there were some concepts of things we wanted to highlight from our community. Um, I, I believe the zoo was one of those. I believe the tower, uh, the beach. The lighthouse, of course, um, was one of those. So maybe there, I'll look back and see um, in that packet that I sent you guys. I think there were some samples in there, um, and see which ones. I'll try to circulate something out. Say, hey, what are the four we want to highlight, or five or six, or whatever that remain we want to do. So, and I, I'll, I don't, don't want to make that decision all myself. I want it to be vetted through. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll get uh, some information to Skylar about how many panels there are actually. Yeah on each side of the bridge, across the bridge, okay. so you have some idea, you know, whether, whether you wanted to have something in each panel, maybe in every other panel, you know, so it doesn't look uh, it, too busy and still gets the desirable message across. And I guess just keeping in mind that the goal of having the railing was to see, so when we top the top, right. we could see through the railing and see the, I guess, the view, if you will, so let's not put, I guess what I'm getting at is don't go overboard with the panels or with the uh, insignias. Okay. Guess that's it. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Street Department Project, Alan. So at the risk of sounding like a broken record, although that really, I'm dating myself when I say broken record, whatever it is nowadays, broken whatever. Um, but it's the same report I've had uh, with one caveat, <clears throat> and that is that, again, I've had conversation with Tim Smith, who is the lead person for the uh, developer and um, and again he, he pretty much said yes they did meet in the beginning of February and they met again last week and they're still putting together a final uh, proposal uh, for us um, and I basically shot back with him uh, that, that Tim we got to get moving on this um, that this that we have been talking about this since the end of November uh, and they originally put a plan in place for December. They wanted to have approval before the end of the year. And now we're sitting here in March with no plan, no approval, no present presentation, no anything. Um, so where we left things off were is that uh, he's had some concerns that he wants to address with, with us, or at least his, his group does. And... Um, and then he wants to, uh, but then he and I are going to get together this week. My hope would be that, uh, one, to one, let him know that the commission is still on board with this, but two, we've addressed some of the issues that he will have, and three, we can get down to a specific date for negotiating session between myself, Ruth Warnheimer from the National Capital Institute, Ken, and any other commissioner who wants to be part of that, Skyler, of course, um, our attorney in Indianapolis, and myself, but that basically saying to him, and I guess this is what I'm asking your blessing to do, is saying, look, you know, that, that come April, we're either going to have a vote on a project agreement um, or, well, we're going to have a vote on a project agreement or we're going to open it up and go back to new developers again. But I just don't see us waiting around indefinitely for them to decide whether they want to do what they want to do. So that's, that's kind of what I'm asking for you. No real vote, but just kind of asking a consensus and direction when I meet with Tim later on this week, and then also some clarity with regards to the project as well. Okay. We're just going to give them a date of like April 1st or something? A date of April 1st? For... I was thinking, what I was thinking is that... Well, I will come back to you in April with one of two things. No, I don't have a project agreement, or yes, I have a project agreement. But if I don't have a project agreement in April, then saying, then I'm, I guess there would be an official vote at that point. Let's start all over again. And that's really what I want to say to him this week. 
Yeah, yeah. It'll be the first meeting. It'll be our regular meeting in April. Yeah. So would you also be a, uh, willing to move forward if they would give you, if they didn't have something by April 1, but they came to you before April 1 and said, hey, we will have something to you by X date? We're at least amenable to that. Within reason, obviously not not sure. January of next year, but no, I, I'm you know I'm basically saying I'm ready right now, and I know I've talked enough with Ken that that, and, and I've talked enough with Ruth, uh, and I've talked enough with Skylar. You know, okay. if, if they come to Mac and say, "Can we have a negotiating session on Friday afternoon?" Schedule permitting, yeah, we're ready to go. I mean, that our position is we're ready to go, uh, and we've been ready to go since uh, December, but uh, maybe maybe not, but certainly been ready to go since January, and here we are in March, so. I just want to get this thing started, or a definitive, uh, definitive resolution on that we're not going to do anything with them. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for a motion or? Not necessarily no. a motion. Okay. It's just basically that I'm on target here, Good. or Sarenic, you're full of it, and back off. <laughs> I, that's fine, too. Thank you. You're on target. Okay. <laughs> okay, anything else on Pine Street? All right, Cheney Run. Request. Hi, I'm Michael Cuss. I'm the general manager at the Michigan City Sanitary District. Um, I'd like to thank all the commissioners for this opportunity to uh, speak to you today about a request for. Um, funding to help of grant grants that we have, but one of the grants in particular requires a 50% match, so that's what I was here to talk about. I uh, prepared a memo on January 31st and sent it to uh, President uh, Barrett for uh, his review and, and the board's review requesting uh, this funding, and then he um, asked me uh, more recently, how is it going to benefit Michigan City and the residents of Michigan City. So I prepared the second memo uh, dated March 4th uh, for Mr. Barron and the commissioners. And um, I thought if it would be okay with the commissioners to give a short presentation on, on this project and get you up, up, to, de up to speed a little bit because you may not all know that much about, about the project. So um, if that's okay, I'd like to proceed. Okay, again, I'm Michael Cuss, General Manager at the Sanitary District. Um, this is the Cheney Run. This slide's a little bit off to the left. That's not going to be good. Looks good up there. Um, this is this picture. This is where the Cheney Run project is located. Obviously, this is Michigan City here, and it's located right here, this little uh, area here in the city. I'll try not to blind you, but those of you for the, that are watching on TV, that's located right here. Um, this is a parcel. Uh, this is the Carwick Nature Park slash Carwick dump site, and this is the Cheney Run uh, discharge right here. Uh, we're basically, I'm going to update you on two projects today. Uh, the Cheney Run, the Carwick Nature Park is located on the east side, and uh, Cheney Run is located on the west side. Um, Carwick Nature Park, uh, it. I, it's really a misnomer to call it a nature park. Several years ago, they tried to do something. As you may know, uh, this was used as a historical dump site, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, trash uh, contaminated. We're hoping to remove that. We're going to install leachate collection. We're going to stabilize the bank, and we're going to uh, revegetate uh, the net with natural species. This is what the site looked like in 2013. Uh, after a rain came down, uh, the site was used as a historical dump from 1965 to 1971. Uh, the dump was closed and covered with sand in 72. And by the way, this is an unpermitted dump site. This wasn't, wasn't permitted. It wasn't constructed properly or anything like that. And then uh, in 13, we had this strong rain that uh, eroded the banks here. This is what we, when we went out there to try to fix this in 2013, this is an example of what we found out there uh, doing a little bit of digging on site. This is what the bank of Trail Creek looked like with this trash and rubbish coming out of the side of the bank. This is a close-up view of that. Uh, what we did, the sanitary district went out under, we just did emergency procedures. Uh, we
we decided this is unacceptable. Trash was floating down Trail Creek. It was heading towards our beaches, and we had to do something. So we went out and stabilized the bank with 250 tons of glacier stone, and we installed this erosion uh, control barrier here with the stone, and we put two layers of, of silt fence up, up in this area is where we did a lot of the work, and we planted some, uh, we put it, brought in some clay and then some black dirt and uh, reseeded this with grass. So we put two berries, erosion control, and we put a little trail back, back through it and put the garbage can back. Um, one of the things about this site, I tell this story a lot, of, is um, when, we, when IDEM told us we needed to close this site, and we weren't allowed to let the public out there uh, in 2012, and we went out there, it was probably around 2.13 or 2.14, it was 2014 after we'd done a little work on it, and some guy's getting out of his car with his fishing poles, and he's got this, he's a younger man, I'd say in his 30s, and a young lady with him, he says, am I allowed to be out here? I said, well, technically no, we're not allowed to have anybody out here, but we're not going to, I'm not going to make you leave. He says, Oh, I'm so happy about that. He said, today's my birthday, and this is my girlfriend, and she told me I could do anything I want to do for my birthday, and I drove all the way here from the north, north side, side of Illinois to come here and go fishing, because this is the best fishing spot around. So, and that's a true story, and it really is a really good fishing spot right in here. Uh, we'll get to some of that in, later on, too. Um, so this was the dump site. Uh, what we decided to do for our corrective action plan here was... Number one was to install a leachate collection system all along the bank of the site here. Uh, NIPSCO actually owns this portion of the property here, uh, and we actually worked with them to extend this trench a little bit further, and they've been very cooperative on, on access and stuff to the site. Uh, so that's going to stop any leachate from the dump site that was getting into Trail Creek. Um, there was a pipe right here that traversed across to Carwick Road, and it was a uh, steel corrugated pipe, and it was rotted out, and the leachate was just leaching into that. We plugged that off, but still leachate was coming along the banks. Then we pulled the banks back up here, made that a little higher, and stabilized it, which I'll show you in a minute. Some of that's just the stuff I just talked about. The project was estimated at $2.4 million, and then after that, we need to spend about another $800,000 estimated. Now, this is estimated for 30 years to do monitoring of the site to make sure that it's, it's, uh, the cleanup is handling the leachate more than anything. Um, so the first thing we did was we had to cut all the trees down. Um, we had to get this done by uh, the end of March of 2019, and we... Um, got out there and did a lot of that work ourselves because uh, after March 30th, you can't cut the trees down anymore because of the Indiana bats. So anything that's over 10 inches and 10 inches round. Um, so we did a lot of that work ourselves. That's just another picture of the trees being cut down. Then after that, the trees were taken out and mulched up to be used for cover and some mulch trails, and the grading of the property started. And everywhere they graded, you just found garbage. I mean, it was amazing to walk out there. It really, I, I've been out to this site so many times, and every time I went, I'd just still be taking pictures because you would just see this stuff. And one of the more early things that we would find is those, and I don't know if they're so popular nowadays, but those plastic baby dolls that all the kids used to have in the days, you'd see one of those laying on the ground staring up at you and stuff. And it was, we saw a lot of those. It was, it was kind of, you know, it was a little eerie at times. Um, so this is just another picture of more of the trash. Um, this is a picture of, of the leachate trench that goes along here all the way along the creek. I'm just going to take a second for the people that are watching on TV. This is the leachate trench here. What that is is there's a pipe in there uh, with stone and then a pipe with holes in it. So the leachate that comes down towards the creek filters through the stone, filters into the pipe, and then the pipe runs back all the way back over here where that uh, backhoe is right there. I'll show you that in a minute. These people on site here, these are uh, some IDEM inspectors. They came out to check on the progress of the site and we were showing them uh, the fabric that you put over the pipe and, and showing them how this works. And this part right here is the bridge, as you may know, in 2010 or 2011 uh, through a grant the City of Michigan City put a bridge in that goes from one side of the creek to the other. Um, so this is what the site looks like after we did a little more restoration along the shore, and this is even more restoration. What we use here is a product called Shore Socks along the shore. I think it's the first time it's ever been used in Indiana, and basically it's a material, you, you lay it down and then you fill up fill it up with mulch and your seed, your grass seed and stuff, and then you wrap it all across the top of that, and it grows through it. But that stops all the erosion from going out into the creek. And it's a really, really good product. It's used a lot down in Florida and stuff. I think we're, we were the first ones to use it here in Indiana. 
And you can even see in this picture some of the grass is already starting to grow through it. Um, this is just another picture of the stabilization. So if anyone was familiar with the site, if you go out there now and you look at it, what it used to look like, it's, it's really quite amazing. really looks nice. And then this is the lift station here, pump station. All that leachate gets collected in this pump station and then it's pumped in a force main uh, to our sanitary sewer. You guys know where the honking bridge is, if you will. On the other, past the honking bridge going to the south and then there's a manhole there. That's where that pumps into. And then... This is the bridge I was talking about. Um, sometimes people call it the bridge to nowhere because there's really nothing on this side, which is the, uh, this is actually the Carwick side looking back on it, and this side on the, in your foreground is the uh, Cheney Run site. So we're hoping to utilize that bridge, but this was the bridge that we were standing under that one picture that I just showed you. Okay, so the Cheney Run wetland projects on the west side. Um, we're hoping to capture sediment and trash uh, floatable trash and, and settle out sediment. We're hoping to remove invasive species in existing wetlands. We're hoping to infiltrate stormwater through current wetlands, install trails and fishing access. And also one thing that's not on here is we hope to, actually we were hoping to put five acres of wetlands in, but it's going to be closer to about maybe seven or eight acres of wetland by the time we're done. Um, a project is, uh, first of all, the Cheney Run Pipe. It drains 3.7 square miles of Michigan City, and it's a nine-foot diameter pipe that enters into the creek. Uh, some people have actually taken a, a little small rowboat up in it a couple of times to take a look at it. Um, it enters the creek, it enters the Trail Creek untreated and unfiltered, and it uh, has approximately 1,500 linear feet long in the channel where it goes into Trail Creek, and obviously it flows into Trail Creek at Carvick Nature Park. Okay, this is the site right here, and this area that's shaded in blue is all the area of Michigan City. As you can see, this is Michigan City. I know you're all familiar with that. This is the area here that shaded in this aqua or this blue that drains out that outfall. So as you can see, a major part of the city drains, and that's about 3.7 square miles all drains out, out through that pipe. Again, this is a picture of the Cheney Run on this side and the Carwick. And this is the pipe. This is your nine foot diameter pipe. And this is what it comes out. And this color is something that one of the things we're really hoping to address because this comes out like a rusty yellowish brownish color. It looks kind of nasty. Uh, we've done some testing of it and we believe it's really more iron than anything. But it really is unsightly and we really believe that we'll be able to knock that out with this project and eliminate that eyesore as it enters Trail Creek. Um, this is a picture a little bit uh, downstream from the channel flowing towards and now this picture here we're standing on the Carwick uh, dump site this is before the trees were cut down obviously and we're looking back up that Cheney Run channel and as you can see it's the difference in color is, is pretty amazing right there um, and this is actually a picture of the Cheney Run site it's actually a very beautiful site um, there are some wetlands there's some lower areas but there's also these these what I would consider forested wetland areas it's really really beautiful area um, in 2014, we received a $65,000 grant uh, from the IDNR, a LAIR grant, which uh, a LAIR stands for Lake and River Enhancement Grant. Any of you that own boats, you have to pay that little fee for your registration, and that fee goes to, your, uh, to the LAIR grant, and so we're getting some of that money returned because I think there's probably a lot of high percentage of boaters here in Michigan City. Um, the feasibility study was completed in 2016, and it recommended installing uh, some natural filtration and infiltration, create at least five new acres of wetlands, and reduce the likelihood of the channel scouring out the banks on the Carwick side, and also to install recreational amenities. The feasibility study indicated that, yes, this project was feasible. It was kind of a concept that, that I'd come up with when I first took a look at this area and vetted it through this feasibility study. Uh, stormwater quality goals, we want to capture 37.5 million gallons of stormwater a year and treat it. We want to reduce sediment by 28,000 pounds a year and nitrogen by 156 pounds a year and phosphorus by about 51 pounds a year. Um, this is the drawing that they came up with for uh, the feasibility study. Just kind of, this is the car work here and just shows some of the trails going through. And then this is a uh, a little video that shows uh, what happens, what's supposed to happen during the project here. It only takes about a, maybe a minute or so less than that. But when the rain starts, 
Uh, what, we're plan what the plan was is to dam this off right here where the channel goes out, and when the rain starts, it'll flood up. The original plan had them moving the stream over here, but that was going to be too expensive, as I'll show you later. And then you see how this starts to inundate with the stormwater as, this, as the ra rain comes, and, then, and you can see it here rising. For those of you on the TV, this is where it's rising, showing your level, and then this is where the water is being captured. And then that's after the rain stops, and then after the rain stops, then it starts to it starts to digress back down. That's that's basically the, the concept from the feasibility study. Drains away. Okay, so now I'm going to move on. Uh, so when we started to move on to, can we actually construct this? We have a feasibility study. What comes next? Well, what came next was a partnering with the Alliance for the Great Lakes and the Delta Institute first with the sanitary district and we found a lot of, of a lot of grant money for both the design and for the construction and uh, stakeholder design meetings after we had that done we had some stakeholder design meetings with the public uh, we held one at the trail creek watershed group to talk about 10 percent designs we held one with the dnr fisheries we held another one with just fishermen and that was at Carwick, uh, Krieger Memorial Hall. And then after we had the 30% plans, we had another meeting. And then we also had a, a, a fifth meeting with the residents of Michigan City to talk about this design. What did we do? They said, don't mess up the fish habitat. We said, sure. They said, don't have the second channel flow into the railroad ditch. That was one of the ideas we had was discharge it on the north side on the railroad ditch. We said, okay, we won't do that. They said, don't let the water get warmer. We plan on leaving all the trees there. In fact, I think we're going to have to take down three trees out of all those trees. So it's going to really be, won't have any, any impact on that. To help with mosquito spawning, we're going to install some micro pools and don't let the fish swim up the second channel. We decided to put what's called an agri drain system in to stop that and help with water is really going to infiltrate through the ground mostly. So regulatory teams, we also did that. We met with them. They said don't let the stormwater fill the wetlands. Uh, watch the... Uh, existing impacts to the high quality wetlands and earth moving up might be uh, expensive. First idea we had was to take the original plan where we wanted to move the creek and put these two other pools in. That didn't go over too well. Then we thought, why don't we build something over here with the wetlands? That idea didn't, didn't really go too well. This is when V3 uh, we put out a request for proposals. They got involved and they came up with this concept here. We're going to put a dam across right here and then a sediment trap here. The purpose of the sediment trap is this will make the, this will be a route just a little bit below the height of the water normally. This will help settle out solids in here and we can get in there for easy access and clean them. This will be a dam that goes across and this will back up the water in this channel and make it flow through this natural low area through here and meander through. Right in this area here is going to be an agri drain system that's going to allow the water to percolate into Trail Creek and then these uh, green spots are where we're going to increase the wetlands. We'll have a berm all the way across here for walking and then eventually we hope to have a trail that goes like this and people can get back in here and walk. Um, this is going to be an emergency spillway up at the top. And should I go over it for the public just really quickly? Um, this is the sediment trap we're here where the sediment is going to get caught. This dam here is going to back up the water so that it can flow through this natural low area here. And this is going to be an agri drain system in here that will have an overflow to the creek, but under normal storm events, it'll mostly percolate through the ground into Trail Creek. And uh, these are going to be wetlands, and these little circles are going to be the micro pools. And then this is the Carwick side, and this trail will come across here. We don't have the trails all designed yet, so that's con somewhat conceptual. So this is an example a picture of the trail and some of the a, a little a boy fishing there along the creek. Um, we have all the Army Corps permits and so forth. Uh, the project costs just for the construction. Now I'm not talking about design. We have we have all the designs already paid for. We've met all our match on the design work, and we got a lot of grant money for the design work too. But for the construction of the stormwater part, we need seven hundred eleven thousand dollars to do the wetland portion. That all that sediment trap was an alternate for eighteen thousand. The J-hook was, uh, and it's some cross veins, that's something the DNR really wanted for Trail Creek to en en uh, enhance the fishing habitat. And we all know fishing is really important. So that was, tw oh sorry, that was $29,000. Uh, we need a bit of barrier wall or a fence up at GAF. That's estimated at 100,000 and some barrier trees at 50,000 and our construction engineering 65.5. So the total cost right now is estimated at 97, 
Um, grant funding, we have a lake and river enhancement, another layer grant. We have another layer grant now. Um, actually, I really should back up. We had another $90,000 layer grant to help us with design, and now we have another layer grant to help us with the construction. So, you know, that's what, $255,000 worth of layer grant money I think that we have for the project. You're the mathematician, right, Alan? Okay. I thought you were. Uh, Great Lakes Restoration Grant, we have $293,945 left on that grant for construction. And then we have a Sustain Our Great Lakes Grant that we can get up to $570,000. But the trick to this grant is we have to match it 50-50. So if we spent $570,000, we would need to match it with $570,000. But we don't really need that much money really to do the whole project. So the amount of grant funding is, is this, which won't, won't cover the whole thing because we have to match this half of that 50-50. So when you look at that amount of money, uh, that's the project cost, 973500 A total remaining without grant, uh, without total remaining after the grants is 570, uh, 579555 uh, Because the Sustain Our Great Lakes grant will only cover 50%, we need to match this with $289,778. And that's why we made the request for $300,000, thinking that if there's a few change orders or something, that we could, you know, we'd still get 50-50 on the grants, but we thought that would give us a little room for some change orders. One of the things we're already thinking about doing is extending that, uh, the trail from the bridge, just get that done now, getting it over to that bridge that crosses over the creek. Um, I don't know, that, sorry that that's off to the side, but this gets to the question that Ken asked me, how will this project benefit the residents of Michigan City? Um, Reduction of pollution into Trail Creek, Lake Michigan, and Michigan City beaches will treat approximately 37 and a half million gallons of stormwater a year. Will reduce the sediment by 28,000 pounds a year, the nitrogen by 156 pounds a year, and the phosphorus by 51 pounds a year. And we all know what the nitrogen and phosphorus will do to Lake Michigan that causes the algae blooms and different things like that. We're somewhat blessed here on the southern shores of Lake Michigan as compared to the folks at Lake Erie who battle that every year. Um, Trash and litter will be kept out of uh, out of the beaches also and will no longer threaten the beautiful Michigan City beaches. Uh, hydraulics and erosion, the project will restore the natural components of the natural hydraulic uh, cycle by increasing opportunities for filtration, infiltration, and evapotranspiration uh, in the expanded wetland areas. Uh, the project improvements can be achieved without adversely affecting any flood elevations in Trail Creek or the Cheney Run. That's a big thing, too. We don't want to cause any flooding. So it's not going to cause any flooding at all. In fact, it will probably help with it. Uh, the project will uh, reduce bank erosion along Trail Creek, especially in the area of the Carwood dump site. Um, what else will it do? It will provide recreational opportunities and environmental education opportunities. The project will offer a wide variety of recreational making the project a good candidate for future financial assistance. Uh, it'll create public access to Trail Creek, improving opportunities for fishing, hiking, and other recreational activities, and it'll offer a good place for environmental education. We plan on having some signs out there and stuff about environmental education. Um, currently, the district is already implementing a recreational and amenities designed through yet another grant that we received uh, through the IDNR. So we've got an enormous amount of grant money on these projects. And the second phase will uh, connect the nearly completed 2 million Carwick uh, dump site slash nature remediation project, which I might want to point out, I should have pointed this out already, that $2.4 million, we did that at zero cost to the city of Michigan City, zero. We did that all through insure, what they call insurance mining. We went back against the city's old insurance agents that we had back in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, and we... Uh, took action against them, and we said, look, there was this problem, and you should have paid for this at the time, so you need to pay us now so we can fix this. And we have, I think, $2.4 million approximately to get that done. So that was zero cost to the city at all. Um, and then um, we hope to utilize that, make a park out of it, and give more back to the nature. Now, the Northeast TIF, again, how will it benefit? The Northeast TIF was created to provide funding for the industrial improvements at the GAF site. And I want to point out, GAF has been a valuable member of the Michigan City community, employs many Michigan City residents, 
and GAF is partnering with the sanitary district because not all of the land where that project's going on, but a considerable amount of it is owned by GAF, and they're going to donate that to the sanitary district, provided that we uh, build them the fence and plant those trees. So they've been a really good partner, and they're very excited about this. Only have to put a sign up thanking them for donating the land. You can't blame them. Uh, so again, the $300,000 request appears to meet the uh, development, uh, redevelopment objectives of the Northeast TIF and will significantly enhance the TIF while at the same time giving back uh, to the community. So that's what I was here to present. I hope that helps you all understand a little better of what we're here to talk about and some of the positive aspects of this. And I, I thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, I could, could try to answer them. Any questions? Uh, Go ahead. Um, we we, we um, started construction already. We started it, I, I want to say, about two weeks ago. And if everything went well, I would think that the Cheney run side would probably be done sometime in uh, April, May, probably May. Excuse me. Uh, Carwick side, we need to plant. We just need to plant trees and so forth. So that one also could be done April, May also. Um, and then as far as getting all the trails in and so forth, that, that would be something that would probably happen you know, if we got the funding for that, and if we were to get it all done quickly, I would, you know, I would probably say fall at the earliest, but maybe a little sooner. But the, the slowness we're having right now is actually, we've been working with GIF for like two years to sign an agreement for the land, and we're close. We're, we're really close, but um, as you guys know, a lot of times that last few feet is the hardest thing to get done. So, um, but as soon as we get that done, I think we're moving. And anybody that would like to come out and look at it, feel free to give me a call. We'll take you out there, no problem. Any other questions? What's the timing for the uh, the funds that you're going to need to buy the three hundred thousand? Um, you know, I can ask me that same question. Uh, I would say that you know, sometime April, May, we you know, by the time we get an invoice, we get an invoice from the contractor, and we have to pay it, and then so somewhere in that range, April, May, June, probably. I asked that just by looking at the balance sheet. You know, our Northeast TIF's at 138000 so we'd be getting a loan from another TIF, or I don't know how we would work that out. Yeah, I'll address that. Uh, that was the idea. <clears throat> we have 138000 now, and then we have two payments left on the TIF bond. Uh, we're getting 273000 increment on each distribution. And of that, 90% goes to GAF to pay their bond payment. So we're, we're getting about 27000 per payment. So we got 30, 38 now. We get another 27 and a 27 on top of that. And after that, then we get 100% of the 273. So we'll be, we can borrow it, we'll have it paid back in a year. Well, year and a half. <laughs> so, any other questions? Did you have a question, sir? No, I'd just like to uh, commend you on the, the work that you did here. Thank you. Um, I remember going to school career and driving by the, over that way that it was, it was messy. And I think this is, it, you've taken an eyesore uh, uh, from Michigan City and made it great. I'm, I'm very appreciative of the fact that you're going to put out signs, hiking trails, it butts up to the uh, career educational uh, area, so I, um, I commend you on that because I think that's one of the things that we can eliminate, if we can eliminate um, these types of ISORs in our community, it just makes us better. So thank you. Thank you, and I agree with you. Okay, any other questions of Mike? Yeah, if there is an overrun on the funds and we've got I think up to eight hundred seventy thousand. You said on that matching one. Mm -hmm. Can we go back to them if you, if we need to get more from that? Um, the the Sogo grant is we have up to five hundred seventy thousand. We were only going to use like I think two hundred and eight three hundred of it, so we'd have more there on an overrun. But we need to match it. But we you know we could probably 
you know, finagle if we need more money through the sanitary district. This would be, this would probably cover us totally. You know, if there was some more overruns, um, I don't anticipate having to come back and saying, you know, could I get 10 more thousand or 20 more thousand? I don't really anticipate that because I really believe that uh, with the sanitary district, you know, we could, we have a stormwater fund that we have some money for projects like this in there, just not enough to cover all this. So this would be really a, a huge help. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much for your time. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and give this little presentation. thought it would be better to you can all have a little better handle. So thank you. Thanks, thank you, Mike. Thank you. All right. Discussion among the commissioners. Well, I think this is a good opportunity for us to put money back in the community uh, and it's I, <laughs> GAF was built in the right geographical location because of budding this uh, dump and nature preserve and everything else that you want to call it I think is, is uh, remediating it like this would really be a benefit to the, to the citizens. So I'll entertain a motion if somebody would like to make it. I'd make the motion that uh, we um, fund the Cheney Run Stormwater Wetland Treatment Project uh, in the amount of $300,000 and uh, take the necessary steps to borrow from the Southside TIF to fund this project. Right, there's a motion and a second that we approve the <clears throat> $300,000 to the Sanitary District with uh, the appropriate financial structure through borrowing from the uh, South Side TIF. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> FOP update. Alan? Uh. <laughs> Um, I guess given the history of, of, of where we are with this is that um, you guys came and approached us, uh, well, no, let's go back even further than that. We have, uh, you approached us better part of a year ago Correct. about the possibility of providing a location for the new FOP following the FOP burning down. Uh, it was dis it was determined by the FOP at that point that the current location on Trail Creek in Trail Creek um, was cost prohibitive from rebuilding there. So you were looking for another site. The Redevelopment Commission owns property on the west side of the street on uh, Six Thousand South Cleveland Avenue, and at the time, just about a year ago, we put out a notice to any prospective bidder for that parcel that um, that we were looking to dispose of it, that we invited uh, offers for uh, purchase, and that the minimum offer had to be the midpoint of our two appraisals, which I want to say was $285,000. Does that sound right? That was the minimum bid that we. But the point is, we asked we asked for a minimum bid, and 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 yeah, here we are. The minimum bid was going to be the the appraisals were two hundred eighty thousand from one appraiser, three hundred seventeen thousand for the other. So a uh, a minimum bid acceptance would have been two hundred ninety eight thousand five hundred dollars. <throat> if someone had come forth with an offer of two hundred ninety eight five or better, we would have been obliged to take it. Nobody came forth with that amount. Uh, the FOP did tender an offer of $50,000, so the official action of the Commission at that point was to reject the offer by the FOP. At that point under the statute, we are allowed to, again, either go one or two directions. We can continue it and to continue with a negotiated sale, either with the FOP or some other prospective buyer, or we could just punt and just not do anything. So, in the interim 12 months or thereabouts 
10 months, we have had a series of discussions with the FOP in terms of both land swap, uh, outright purchase. Uh, we've done some work and we've done some investigation of the current FOP site in on Johnson Road. And I think basically have come to the conclusion <coughs> Um, from our from John Doyle, who has surveyed it, as well as other kind of, uh, other discussions that we've had, that that property, quite frankly, is is, is I'm gonna, I don't want to shoot you in the foot here, but 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 certainly would have no benefit for redevelopment purposes to the redevelopment commission. That's probably the nicest way to say that. Um, so that leaves us then at this point: is that do we go forth with a negotiated sale of the current six thousand Cleveland Avenue uh, property with the FOP, um, or do we just, like I said, basically where we were a year ago, just not negotiate sale, just not do anything, and just continue to leave that parcel as is? One of the things that we've talked about is subdividing that parcel into two different areas that would meet FOPs perhaps could meet FOP's need to build a new FOP there. Um, and then we would still have half a parcel, I think, Skylar, and that was like seven some odd acres, so three and roughly three and a half acres per parcel. Um, so that would be another option. So that's kind of where we are today, is, is whether we want to negotiate with the FOP, whether we don't want to negotiate, and if we do want to negotiate, what are we negotiating? That sounds pretty close, sir. Okay, any... Do you have anything to add, Tom? Uh, only that, you know, we, we... Obviously, we came to the city for some help um, in trying to find a location and hopefully try to take some type of property uh, that was not being used by the city. Uh, one of the ones we looked at was the old Pulaski uh, gas station on the Boulevard and Johnson Road, but most people know about that. And the city bought that because there was no heirs, but after we did some research, we found out the city used a coastal grant to purchase that, and I think it's, you can't build on for 15 years, is it? It, it has a restrictive covenant that goes along with using the money to purchase and demolish, and yeah, it has a, I, I want to say 15 to 20 years. I believe it was 15, so it was, I mean, we've been trying to, to try and find something, and obviously the uh, Cleveland Ave property appealed to us. Uh, we know it was a, uh, I think it was a large purchase. The city did way years ago to, in order to build a city fire station. Um, and the property across the street obviously has been sitting forever and nobody's ever developed it. So we thought that that would be, I mean, it utilized, it'll utilize for us because now we'll be in Michigan City and not outside of Michigan City where we've always, we're a Michigan City FOP. But we've had our lodge in Trail Creek, but so it always a little confusing. We wanted to get in city services. <clears throat> we wanted to put our building in Michigan City. That's been our goal the whole time is to be in the city limits. But we just had to try to find something that we'd be able to utilize. And Cleveland Ave seemed to be a very util a great location for us to build uh, what we feel is going to be a, a, a very nice building. So it's about what I have. <coughs> Any comments from the commissioners? I think we want to um, work with you and try to find a resolution. Well, for we everybody. appreciate that. Yeah. So, motion to continue to negotiate. Yeah. Okay. I'd second that and and just add to that we would um, ask Skylar to work work through that process. Is that appropriate? I can, uh, I can do that. With, I can work with Pat on that. If that's if that would. That's great. Okay. Can we get more definitive on that? Though? Are we talking about? Uh, are we talking about negotiating negotiating with property for one full thing or subdividing into two? For the one full thing. Okay. I, I, yeah. All right. There's a motion and a second that we continue negotiating for the entire parcel. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. All right. House and Associates. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Tim Haas with Haas and Associates. Brian Laughlin is here. He's got a handout. 
exhibit for you to take a look at while we're talking about this um, town center drive uh, proposal and project. So this project is in regards to Town Center Drive. It's uh, the existing frontage road that starts on the north end at Meyer Drive and then continues south for about 2,600 feet to its south terminus, which is approximately at the south end of the uh, Menards property. And there's been an intent by the city uh, for about 20 years uh, off and on throughout that 20-year period to extend that Meyer or Town Center Drive pro uh, road another 460 feet south and connect to the Walmart uh, entry that, that intersects Highway 421. Um, the problem with doing that, uh, besides the fact that there's um, you know three private parcels in between um, the the end of the road and and the uh, Walmart Drive, uh, there are wetlands in there, and one of the property, the wetlands on one of the property are deed restricted, which makes it a little bit more difficult to to build anything in that property. Um, the Redevelopment Commission back in 2016 hired Haas and Associates, and we had some sub-consultants working with us to look into this problem or extending this road and look at um, other options. Uh, that did not involve this deed restricted. Kankoff is the name of the property owner uh, property. And so we looked at a more circuitous route that would have had two 90 degree bends at the uh, south end of the current pavement there. The road would, would uh, angle off to the east at 90 degree bend, get further over uh, maybe 300 to 500 feet to the east and then 90 degree bend south and uh, then get over to, to Walmart's property through that route. So as part of that project, uh, we had a phase one environmental site assessment done <clears throat> on that circuitous route where there maybe would be a public right of way someday. We had, and it was, the property showed that there was no need to go to a phase two um, environmental site assessment, so that was good. Uh, and then also we had a wetland delineation done and, and you know, surveyed the wetland delineation, put this all on exhibits, met with the regulators from the United States Army Corps of Engineers out of the Chicago district, which is different uh, than, than the, the, the core at that time in 2016. We're under the jurisdiction of the Chicago district as opposed to previous ef efforts that were made by the city back in like 2006-ish. Uh, the, the city was under the direction of the Corps out of the Detroit office. So there's new people from the Corps involved in uh, 2016 than there had been previously. Uh, we also had the IDNR at these meetings and the IDEM, people who deal with wetlands for uh, D Department of Environmental Management. So in the process of doing all that, um, we got a real positive reaction from the uh, regulators, the, the three entities that I just mentioned, and they they were they they came to understand the need for the project and, and the fact that this project would relieve traffic off of Highway 421. Um, so so that that fits in with you know at that time the redevelopment commissions the city's plans to to have uh, more frontage roads and rearage roads to relieve traffic on 421. Um, it would also provide for a safe pedestrian access as opposed to uh, people walking on the, on the east side of 421 as they do now. This would give them an alternate route to, to walk along to get to all those major big boxes over there, as well as the out lots that front 421. Um, so there was some, some safety issues. The regulators, um, they bought in. Uh, they, they said, yeah, they think that they could go along in this kind of a case with lifting the deed restriction from the Kankoff property. Uh, they said the next steps would be for the city, Redevelopment Commission essentially, to move forward with a formal permit application to them uh, for this road. Uh, that would involve doing some design on the road extension, you know, straight through as shown by the right-of-way extension that's um, Hatched in red and orange on the exhibit that you're looking at. That's about 460 feet. 
um, the project at that time in 2016 uh, became a lower priority for the city and things didn't move forward at that time for many reasons. Um, like I say, it just became a lower priority. So in the recent past, uh, we've been meeting and talking with um, representatives of the Redevelopment Commission about this. And as a result, we brought this proposal to you uh, today. The proposal that you have um, is pretty involved and, and um, explains in detail many of the steps that would be, would be required to, to ultimately get to the conclusion, which would be to put in that 450 or 60 foot road extension. In addition to all of that about the 460 foot road extension, there's a second part of this proposal, and that involves uh, the existing town center drive uh, on the north, starting at Meyer Drive and then going all the way south to the existing south terminus. That's approximately 2,340 feet of existing asphalt road, two thirds of which is in uh, very poor condition. Um, my understanding of what happened back when these big boxes were being constructed was that they got this built um, as part of their development and then it came time as is typical of these types of developments to dedicate the public right-of-way and public infrastructure through the Board of Works to the City of Michigan City and uh, the, I, I believe, I, I'm not 100% sure of this, but I believe that at that time the then city engineer uh, and, and his staff did not believe that the roads were constructed up to Michigan City road standards, and therefore the city never moved forward with accepting dedication of two out of three of these sections of road, uh, one, one being um, west of Meyer and one being west of Lowe's. Uh, from the research that we did last year, including uh, title work, um, it appears that Menard's section of road was dedicated and accepted by the city. So that leaves the other two to the north, those two sections that are, are currently still private roads. And that's um, another thing that in the past the, the city administration and redevelopment commission had been interested in getting those two sections you know, dedicated. Uh, you know, repaired up to city standards and then dedicated uh, to become right, public right-of-way, um, which would be also consistent with extending Town Center Drive south another 460 feet to connect to Walmart's drive. So the two parts of the proposal, the one that I've described in detail regarding the environmental per permitting and everything for the 460-foot extension, then the second part is to take pavement corings, uh, about 20 pavement corings in that existing section that the city is contemplating, uh, maybe someday accepting as a, as a public right-of-way. Um, but working with the city engineer's office, Jeff Wright, uh, and and looking at those pavement corings and deciding you know what if anything needs to be done to the pavement sections there to bring them up to standard and um, then after that becomes a known then decide whether the city really is and the redevelopment commission really is interested in moving forward with whatever those um, repair techniques might be Might I add some things? So we did a 421 corridor plan. This was one of the roads that was called out to uh, extend. Um, as um, Mr. Haas alluded to, um, we feel that this could serve as we've all often wanted to put sidewalks down there. Well, the problem with 421 is that it's pretty much taking up all the right of way. There's not a lot of right of way, and the development has built nearly to the right of way with 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 parking lots, uh, there's a lot of uh, topo topographical things in front of, you might recall, in front of big lots, it kind of drops off there. Um, so some of the things we were looking at is how can we utilize these crop, these uh, frontage roads to service our community and provide safety and public access from a standpoint of buses could go down these roads, we could have shelters on the roads, uh, probably much easier to permit through uh, shelters through our own Board of Works rather than NDOT, but also just lack of space. And then once we put a shelter there, there's nowhere to go. There's no sidewalks. So here we're putting, if we did decide to take over the road, or can take over the road, 
meaning should we take over the road once we get the corings, um, we could have bus shelters here. You would be dropped off in an area where you probably want to go. Maybe you work there or you're going to get your groceries there. So there's a reason to go there and it's safe. There's a place to go. Um, anyways, that's just a little bit more uh, expansion upon why we're looking at Town Center Drive. You have a chance to read the proposal. I think the other thing you kind of alluded to it though, but this is the re the enhancement of this area also as part of the South Gateway plan. It was recommended that we provide an alternative route to the 421 corridor, and this would have been uh, the ultimate goal being is to further development along that whole area there as an alternative to 421 more for pedestrians. And pedestrians, it could also take. Um, a little bit of load off of Franklin Street. You can actually, so right now you go to Walmart and you have to go back out on a Franklin to get to these. Well, right. then you're back, you're entering back into the traffic and getting back on 421. This would serve as a cross through, which we like to encourage um, cross access easements. I really try to get those when I can with review of those developments. But really, you're trying to get. You're, you're, you're not you're preventing a person from having to get back on if we can get this road connected through. They would just get on and go to Myers or go to their next stop, if you will, or get on Myers Drive and go out to Cleveland and not even get on 421. But it wasn't part of it, just something that's in a vacuum. It's part of an overall development. Absolutely. It was part of the plan, and uh, it's been looked at heavily for part of our plan. Absolutely. As well as a few others. Mr. Do you know of any remedies in the event that the three landowners are a little reluctant to deal with us? In other words, can well, we use the eminent domain if we have to? It, it seems as though eminent domain would be something for the city to consider in this application uh, because of the you know, safety improvements for both vehicular and, and pedestrian traffic along 421. It's consistent with plans that the city has had for a long time. Um, it seems like it fits. I guess the last piece of that would be that um, those three landowners really can't do anything with that property, with the exception of maybe one, mm -hmm. because of the uh, the wetlands issue. So yeah, the the, the one, of, one of them is, is very narrow, 50, yeah, 50 feet anywhere. wide. Yeah. It would be difficult to build much on that 50 foot wide strip. Uh, one of them has deed restrictions on a wetland and the other one has almost certainly mostly wetlands. Yeah. So one of the, um, there's there's a couple things I'd like to briefly mention. There's, there's a new program that became effective in Indiana last year. It's called the in-lieu fee program for wetland mitigation and uh, it's it makes it in many cases much more simple for agencies such as, as this board to mitigate wetlands uh, through basically just paying a fee into a program that's run by the um, Indiana Department of Environmental Management and the DNR wherein entities like this pay in this fee and once the, the pot gets big enough, uh, the money gets enough, then that those governmental agencies will determine a location to build new wetlands or expand existing wetlands or this kind of thing. So it's more of a holistic centralized approach to wetland mitigation wherein it, you, it doesn't become your job to find a place to, to find four acres of, you know that could be turned into wooded, wooded wetlands. Uh, they'll take care of those things, you just pay them the money. So the, another thing is there's no fee. I don't have a fee for our services on this because there's some of the things to, I want to get some feedback um, from this, this board on, on the scope. Um, and, and there's something that actually just, just struck us um, just recently. Um, there are these east-west connecting roads that also were intended to someday become public right-of-way. Uh, they're not labeled with any, but if you look in front of like Lowe's, there's, uh, I don't know the names of the two businesses on either side on the outlots, but um, there's an east-west connector to Franklin. I don't know if those should be. That's something for the city to think about whether, you know, and I haven't even talked with the city engineer about this yet. Or <clears throat> I've talked with them a little bit about it. I think we wanted to get the corings and just see how the road's built before we make any formal 
request of the Board of Works, but I, I know that he is curious about, you know, the cross streets and mm. all of Town Center Drive, if you will. It, it was all the topic of discussion. So I would say that if we did, I guess, take over it, I mean, it makes sense that we would take over all, all of it, the cross mm -hmm. streets too, but that's for, I don't, I don't want to speak for the city engineer, sure. that's really for him. It's his yeah. Board of Works purview and... Uh, Honestly, in the end, it becomes his right of way to take care of and fund, if you will. So, so that that could be, right now, that's not specifically mentioned. There's at least um, looks like two two of those east west connectors there that are not dedicated to the city yet. There are two of them on the south end that are public right of way. Uh, one of them is the a continuation of Larkspur Lane, and then. Just south of that, maybe 400 feet, is another one. Um, I'm not sure if it even has a name, that, that other east-west connector. It's, it might be like Town Center Court or something like that. But uh, anyway, there's the two on the north end that, you know, that you, you know, the city might consider adding in for pavement corings, things like that, you know, to take a look at it. Do you know if the city plows those now? I, I don't know who maintains them now. Um, I did notice that Myers has been paved in the not too distant past their their section so I, I imagine they did that themselves and, and I know it's not in the scope of this but also to the east side of Meyer Drive that whole road is not uh, city owned it's the east end of Meyer by, by, uh, by the theater the by the theaters yeah. really that's yeah, still that's not different. dedicated no. Well, I didn't piece, know that. There's a piece right in Tim, right where Tim hits Meyer Drive. Yeah, right where it ends yeah. here on this map. That all that Meyer Drive is not. That's all privately owned still. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So I I know that you need time to take this all in and and think about it. Um, if if you are interested in, I'm sorry. Did you? No, no, go ahead. If if you are interested in doing something that would um, help things move if you decide to move forward. It would be to authorize us to do topographic surveying in this the, this 460 foot area because uh, if we wait till after the leaves uh, come out, it's going to make it a lot more difficult to to survey that. Um, there's there's heavy heavy brush in there and phragmites and different trees that grow in wetlands. So you'd like that approval tonight? To do that, that, that would be a good way to kind of get that in the can before, you know, say say if you decide in a month or two to move forward, at that time it would be uh, much more difficult to survey it because the sight lines would be very short. So Tim, can you um, estimate what that potential cost would be? The, the surveying uh, yeah, for the just the topo survey yeah. and, and then drafting up the existing conditions that we, we survey. Well, if if we've got it two ways, there there's a lot of um, a lot of wetland plants in there, including the Phragmites. Those are real tall ones, right. and and uh, if if we can use our total our uh, GPS unit, so it's a one person survey, uh, we're right around forty three hundred. But if it takes a two person crew because we're not um, able to to get a good signal. Through all, you know, we plan to do some clearing, but but not major clearing, not taking down trees or anything like that. Um, that would that could be up as high as like, I think it was. This is all based on estimated man hours. We were up as high as eighty three hundred for that, so somewhere in between okay. forty three and eighty three. Okay, so I, I like this project. We we talked about it a little bit. I think this makes sense. Um, I wanted to ask. Uh, um, there have been no borings to date. Is that correct? No, no, no borings, borings today. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, that's a good point, Commissioner. Um, we wanted to do borings back in 2016, mm -hmm. but uh, in order to do borings, we wanted we needed to get the permission of the property owners, and only uh, the only one of those three that responded was uh, the northernmost, Mr. Chalukian. The other two property owners, I, I they, they never responded okay. with our request to get permission to gain access. Or boring soil borings. It is. It is not. I, I expect that the soil is not going to be good soil right. back there, as far as you know, from structural suitability for building roads. Um, hopefully, it's not that deep to good soil. I, I wouldn't be surprised if good soil is within you know ten feet of the surface or something. 
and none of the borings on the road have started. No. Okay. Okay. I just want to make that clear. I, I had, had heard not, I just heard that there were borings, or at least discussions that borings were started. So. Oh, on the, in the pavement. Correct. The pavement corings. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not aware of any right. corings. No, there's there none that have started. We were going to do it with this project. This project. Okay. okay. So it, it's a little bit of a misnomer. They're not quite pavement corings. They go into the soil beneath the pavement, so right. we can look at more of a, you know, what's the soil also instead of just what's what's the road made of. Got it. So would it be uh, t to work through your uh, request would be as if we gave Skyler um, the, give you the ability to start the, process gives Skyler the ability to approve a uh, purchase order or an agreement up to X amount of dollars so that we wouldn't have to wait until our next meeting to approve that. So, total, yeah. yeah, so I, yeah, so I guess what I would, was your second dollar amount 8,300? Our involvement with uh, coordinating the, the corings is... No, 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 no tell, I'm sorry, the, t the topographical... Oh, what, was, what were the two numbers? Yes, sir. Uh, a range of forty-three to eighty-three hundred dollars. Okay. So I, I make the motion that uh, we would uh, request uh, Haas Associates to prepare uh, an, an agreement for us to do the topo work on this property and give Skyler the ability, once reviewed by Skyler and our attorney, up to eighty-three from forty-three hundred dollars to eighty-three hundred dollars. If that falls within that range, then we would move, we can move forward prior to our next meeting. Tim, do you feel 8,300s are very, is that a tight number? Uh, uh, no, I, th I think it should be, especially if we can get out there before okay. the leaves. Okay, I just making sure. Thanks. You're, you're basically giving authorization to expand up to, to $8,300 for the service of the yeah. Tim Mistress, and you yeah. can do that, yes. That's my motion. Okay, there's a motion. Motion a second that we approve the expenditure of up to $8,300 for a topographical survey uh, with Haas and Associates. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Skylar, regarding those corings, if you plan to make progress on them, I've got a proposal and I can share whatever I've got with you from. Uh, company to do those corings the, the corings on town center drive in in the pavement yes okay um again that was i've discussed that with um with our city engineer just being transparent and we just thought it was better to fold it into this project since we are looking at a couple different things which would be paving repaving taking over the road dedication mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of involvement in this and look at it looking at it as a project rather than uh piece milling it together like okay. he pays for this you know we, we just thought it looked better it would work function better as a project okay so. thank you all right Skyler do you want to talk about the improvements to the plaza so we have um, so tonight uh, just for discussion and I have uh, Mr. Stimley here as well who's most recently our uh, events coordinator and maybe he can speak up a little bit or back me up on this these these items we've oft, often talked about uh, making minor improvements to the area we have called the plaza right now it's it's it is a downtown area it's on 7th street we have some vacant land there we're take, taking care of it um, it's being used uh, readily by Main Street Association um, I've recently talked to the mayor about this project as well, and we just feel I would like to explore making some minor improvements. Some of those minor improvements that we would need to make a functional space would be power, water, maybe a sanitation hookup of some sort. Um, there, 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 there's a few you know, lights we may need. I, I don't know if the lights down there are sufficient. There's a few things we may not do right now, but most, I think, dire are power and water. We have to have those to put on an event. Um, right now the only uh, 
people that can put on an event are the people who have access to um, buy generators or rent generators for an event. Um, I believe by doing these minor improvements, we could open it up to people, anyone who wanted to use that space. They would obviously have to come to us with requests. Board of Works, you know how we work that request. Uh, but also Johnny could maybe help program some of those events down there. Um, and, and just help us use that space. I just, I really hate to see that space sit there um, and just not be used um, when, when, when I think there are organizations who want to use it or who can or could use it um, in the future. So some of the ideas is putting enough power there to operate a stage. You know, that does take a, quite a bit more power. Um, I think at this time I've engaged Johnny and I think we're going to look at putting a group together maybe next week to walk the site and uh, some of the people that would be involved in that would be Main Street. Um, they're, they're just the most, they have the most knowledge um, with respect to what's it, how much power does it take to do an event? How much water does it take to use? Um, Arturo is one of those people who kind of organizes the, the food events down there. Um, the taste, you might recall. Uh, we, all, we, all, we, we have to have water at all those events. We have to have water to wash your hands, thing, etc. So, they're very much aware of what it takes, uh, and maybe we can, I don't know, build off that uh, knowledge and, and make it accessible for not just Main Street, but maybe there's other organizations that would like to use this, this space. Um, Johnny, anything to add? Yeah. Any comments? Um, like you said, Johnny Stemley, uh, 3205 till in, uh, I think Skyler kind of summed it up. Even uh, this past weekend, when we had the St. Patrick's Day parade, we had to get a, you know, we had to call uh, Marcus Electric to to get a special hookup too for some of the food vendors. So you know, something minimal down there. Um, I have been getting some calls from some different organizations, you know, uh, which I really think would help out if we did have like uh, the minimum power, water, and uh, look into things like this, so we can use the land and the property down there to throw little festivals or what have you. Um, at this point in time, I, I, I don't have a, uh, a cost request right now, um, but I would like just kind of your blessing, if you will, to, uh, to go forth and kind of start this project, you know. Yeah, I think that would be appropriate. Uh, <clears throat> come up with cost what we need and cost estimates and put a package together. Oh, Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, Mr. Stimley, and Scott and myself, we have talked about this. Uh, what I, I, I see no immediate permanent plans for that area. So I, what I envision in it for, for short-term use, short-term being several years, a couple summers, until a developer steps forward with a viable plan, is to uh, install temporary power, uh, PVC conduit underground, what we need, a sanitary line, and uh, water to, uh, to create a, a venue for uh, events. I'd like to have a, build a permanent, a temporary stage there, portable, uh, have power for lighting to support a stage, for events and the sanitary and the electric would also come in for a, uh, a, a, a quality sanitary facility, a toilet trailer with several units inside rather than the, the porta johns that are very hard to maintain and it would, it would keep the cost down because it, I, when I say temporary I'm, I'm, I'm talking about facilities that would uh, functional but they would be removed when, when it comes time to permanently develop that lot. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Scott, right. um, I, I like the idea of us trying to do something to make that, that area more functional. It, it's all grass. Um, if you envision food trucks driving on the grass, have, have you thought I, I, have any ideas on that? Because I certainly Absolutely. to have food trucks in that area on grass is, and it rains and... I mean, I think we have to think about some of the logistics and some of the, I guess, uh, drawbacks of that area. It is grass, so if it's very wet or, say, frozen and thaws, 
it could get really sloppy quick, which it has on us for shelf ice a couple of times. Uh, we've had some warm shelf, shelf ice uh, festivals there. Um, I envision that if we had food trucks, that they would stay on 7th Street. So we still may be stuck with closing 7th or, or barricading it, but not getting rid of 7th. That it, we would just be typical setup as we've set up for taste and other events down there. Um, but I don't envision... I mean, there may have to be an alternative. We have to talk through some of these things. There may have to be an alternative. Uh, I remember we've had Shelf Ice plan to have an event on the site, and it was just so sloppy we had to flip it to the street because it was just too too it was too much thaw at that time. So there are some things we need to think about. Um, I I don't know if that answers the question. I know that we've looked at putting hard surface in there, and it's just it's very. Uh, that, that would not be a minimal improvement. That would probably be a very expensive improvement. But I think that you have enough space on 7th Street with the parking, with it closed in the parking area. If you did want to have, say, a food truck rally or something like that, you could probably fit the trucks in those parking spaces and have them vend into 7th or, or vend onto the sidewalk. Um, you'd have enough space for people to go in between. But you'd have to close 7th for, for that period of time, yeah. but not permanently. I would suggest we put a group together, Skyler, Johnny, anybody on the commission who'd like to serve on it? Johnny? Good. Two I was hoping you'd volunteer uh, to go through that. Uh, what's needed, where, when, and some cost estimates. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the August MAC change order. Both of these change orders have to do with um, the station block properties. The first one uh, for $550. Um, basically, when they do a phase one, they look back at the history of property owners and businesses that have been on a site on the property of 1010 Franklin. There obviously was some reason why. Um, in the phase one that there was a possibility of an underground storage tank so the change order is to uh, confirm or well confirm the existence or confirm the non-existence of an underground storage tank uh, on the southwest side of the building uh, by doing uh, boring into that and then also in addition to that though it confirms this, that the tank is present but also what kind of shape it's in and so we determine whether and to what extent remediation will be necessary. Um, there literally have been times that I'm aware of where there's been a, a business there and the phase one came back that we probably need to look at a possibility of an underground storage tank being present and lo and behold it wasn't there. So that's why I'm sorry we, we can there's probably a 99% certainty there is one there but we need to confirm that anyway before we can actually go forth with uh, uh, appraisals and, and acquisition and subsequent development of that area. Okay, any questions of Alan? Someone like to make a motion we approve the change orders? Make a motion we approve the change order for $550. I second it. Motion is second. Did you discuss the seven? I will discuss that also next year. Right. Motion is second we approve the change order for August neck in the amount of $550. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The second change order is for remediation cost estimate for property located on 1002 Franklin Street. I think when I first sent this to you, I had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, I now know what I'm talking about. Um, and this falls under the category of general federal bureaucracy. Uh, as as imposed as imposed on us, as we've talked about before, with regards to these properties, station block, and when we're involved in a um, federal project and with federal funds, there are certain requirements we have to adhere to. Whenever there is a so we have all these properties down there at station block at this point. Well, all well, these probably six properties down at station block. Uh, all the phase ones, for the most part, came back clean, other than the one thing on 1010 that we just talked about, and we knew 1002 was going to be a problem. We've known it was going to be a problem for years. Um, under the FTA, we really need to, when we've discovered there has been, through a phase one and then a phase two, that there have been um, contaminants under there, 
that the requir federal requirement is that um, when we do the environmental study, there also has to be a remediation cost estimate. Uh, and then that needs to be given to BLNN as they prepare for an informal appraisal of the property and then subsequently going into purchase offers and relocation. So what this change order then is for the actual preparation of what they're estimating, August Mac would be estimating to be the cost to remediate this property from the contaminants that are in the soil. Uh, their estimate was somewhere between the areas of $450,000 and $800,000, depending upon the, the cleanup that's going to be preferred, and that's down for a later date. But what I'm asking you to prove today, then, is the $700 so that they can prepare those documents to provide to BLN, and then that ultimately goes into the um, actual purchase um, and relocation cost that would be offered to the property owner. That's it. Anybody have a question about that? <laughs> uh, no, it, 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 it's a, a, for me, it's a, a function of, it, it's a cost estimate, it's cost of doing business versus I'm going to charge you $700 so I can put this cost estimate together. That's where I struggle. I struggle with that with my job every day, struggle at it with here. I don't have any other environmental company do that to me. Uh, the only thing I just would would say, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, they're going to charge us seven hundred dollars to do something that's required of us by the federal government. Right. I mean, this task has to be done. I know. The question is whether August Mac is going to do it for free, or whether August Mac is going to charge us seven hundred dollars for it. That's right. Or somebody else is going to. Well, August Mac is our contracted environment, right. so right. we're paying them money. This is seven hundred dollars on top of what we've already paid them to do the overall environmentals for the entire station block property. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. So I understand. Someone like to make a motion on this change order? Make a motion to approve the uh, change order for seven hundred dollars. Motion a second. Do we approve a change order in the amount of seven hundred dollars with August Mac? Any additional discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. You get Chris's name. Okay. Uh, report by legal counsel. The only other thing is, to, in addition to everything else I've talked about, is that the commission met in executive session before tonight's meeting. Uh, no items were discussed that were not permitted by the open door law, and no decisions were made. Okay. Uh, report from director. Um, there's one item that I would like to take up this time that we did not have on the agenda, but uh, it is basically um, I'd like to request to um, to at least to contact uh, Rob Hunden of Hunden uh, Strategic, I think is the name of the company. Uh, you might recall they're the ones who did our original RFQ. I believe it was an RFQ for our You Are Beautiful site or our hotel site, as we like to call it uh, or consider it. Um, we would like to re-engage him to find out what we have to do to re-notify this RFQ and go back out for proposals for the or for the uh, hotel site. So if that's okay. I would like to. Con I have not contacted him yet, but I will do that immediately if you so choose. I make a motion that Skyler contact Mr. Hunden for that. Second. Motion is second that <coughs> we reopen the RFQ for the uh, You Are Beautiful site. And go with, oh, sorry. Yeah. With Rob Hunden, yes. strategic. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Public comment? Dwayne Perry, Mayor of Michigan City. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, I came here tonight primarily to comment on the apartment complex on the former Memorial Hospital site. At this juncture, I'm becoming 
concerned that it's going to be a quality project, specifically that it's going to be the luxury Pine Street apartments that I've heard from day one it's going to be. This project's carried on way too far. It's dragging out. I've heard a lot of information on due dates and dollars, but very little on details, construction details. All I've seen has, have been artist renditions of the complex, no drawings, no, no concrete details. And as far as the development firm that's involved in it, Michigan City Developers, LLC, I'd like to see resumes. I'd like to see an organizational chart. I'd like to see financial reports on these people. I don't know who they are. This is a $45 million project, which should actually be more. Because what I see, I won't support. From day one, I felt this should be condominiums. It should be owner-occupied dwellings, not apartments. It's apartments, so we're moving forward. But with the way things are going, I'm becoming very concerned that it's going to be subsidized living. And I will not support subsidized living in this area. The, upstreet, the Uptown Arts District that we're trying to revitalize. I feel that at this time, Michigan City has more than adequate subsidized housing. We may need more in the future, but we do not need it right now. We do not need it for this project. We've got to see more out of this group. This is, this is uh, struggling. The details aren't there. It's proceeded way too slowly. I need to feel more about, better about this thing. If I have any fear at all that it's going to end up subsidized housing, I won't support it. And I hope that the commissioners that I appointed feel the same way as I do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any other public comment? Yes, uh, Kevin Harmon, 421 East 6th Street. Uh, <clears throat> the, feet, the housing development is going to be coming down uh, within the next few years. I'm kind of concerned about what type of development is going to take place. Is it going to be similar to the Wexford Apartments out in Southgate, where you have nice driveway entry, uh, you know, wash your dryer hookup, and that sort of thing? that I'm looking for a better housing option for the last two and a half years. And uh, I'd like to get out there to Wexford, but they keep telling me that there's no vacancies, uh, there's no, you can't get on the waiting list and that sort of thing. So I'm hoping that uh, this is going to be similar to that. And is it going to be information so a person like myself can apply for it and make sure that I can get one of those? I'm really concerned about that. Thank you, Kevin. Any other public comment? Any other public comment? Hearing none, any comments from the commissioners? That I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. The uh, next meeting date is April 13th. So moved. Motion second, we adjourn. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you.